This is a risky dode of risk assessment for Mayor Risk LLC and editor of the North Africa Journal. The discussion on Libya that follows was recorded on the 9th of January. It was with analyst Alessandra Bruno, which took place a day or two before the two warring parties agreed on a truce. Although there have been some minor breaches to the ceasefire, there has been a diplomatic effort that saw the emergence of Russia as a serious power broker ahead of the Berlin conference. The talk was conducted through regular phone, hence the quality of the audio. Thank you, Alessandro, for taking a moment to uh, speak to us and share your thoughts with the audience. I think today I'd like to go back to uh, some of the discussions that we had about uh, specifically about Libya, uh, as things seem to be uh, accelerating, uh, seemingly accelerating. Uh, just for um, you know, for the uh, audience, today is the 9th of uh, uh, of January 2020, and uh, the latest news from Libya suggests that all the um, apparent diplomatic frenzy uh, that you see in Europe and um, and and elsewhere seem to not bear any fruit, considering that Haftar's uh, last comment was that no, we're not gonna. There's not gonna be any ceasefire. We're gonna keep going. On the military front, I think uh, the latest uh, suggests that there has been, well, there have been clashes between Sirte and uh, and Misrata. That's sort of the southern mm-hmm. region closer to uh, to Tripoli. And and to be frank, uh, you know, there's probably a lot of boots on the ground in Tripoli. Uh, apparently, from what we're hearing from mercenaries from Africa to Russian mercenaries to mm-hmm. agents uh, working for France, and I would guess the Italians, everybody's there. Chinese drones are there. Chinese drones purchased by United Arab Emirates are there. Uh, you know, is, at, at the end of the day, uh, do we need a, so a final, I'm not sure what the right term is, a final bang, big bang, to sort this mess out, uh, or or will sort of the return to a status quo of um, nothing happening and we keep uh, hoping for peace is going to continue to uh, lengthen the, the the misery in which the the, the poorly beaten people are in. Well, that is the the big question because um, on the one hand, uh, if General Haftar did gain an upper hand, uh, well, he has some strength, but obviously not too much, not enough to take Tripoli, because he has been on the outskirts of Tripoli for the past nine months, at least, I think since last April or last mm-hmm. May, uh, he's been on the outskirts of Tripoli. So this this is the final move um, and uh, uh, accelerated the, um, uh, sorry, the, the impetus is accelerated by the fact that um, Erdogan, uh, president of Turkey, has decided to revive Ottoman ambitions and uh, that he wants some um, uh, an energy uh, greater energy security uh, to prevent the uh, uh, the uh, apparent uh, the agreement between is it Greece Israel and uh, Cyprus mm-hmm. uh, for the for uh, for the gas pipeline so I, I think uh, Turkey does not want that so they want to uh, make a breach to Tripoli and secure that whole area. After all, Haftar is backed by the Egyptians. So if that were the case, uh, the, each, um, Turkey would control that whole coast line. And uh, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, Turkey will make inroads in Tunisia as well, because there is a strong Muslim Brotherhood party, which is one of the allies of Erdogan. After all, Erdogan is the representative of the Muslim Brotherhood, in a sense, in Turkey. So, um, two places, two, Tripoli and Tunis, fit into that strategy. Um, uh, and th- that said, how I- Italy is not, which has backed the Tripoli government, the uh, government of uh, uh, Al Sarraj, um, may not be too pleased about uh, Turkey's. Uh, effort to back the very same horse they're backing, 
because uh, if Turkey takes over, um, sorry, if Turkey uh, enters uh, Tripoli with the full, with a much more organized military force than anyone has right now on the ground, it would be an official force. I think it would not be a mercenary force or hopefully it would not be a force of uh, um, militias because that's one of the problems uh, that uh, that it, Tripoli, that Libya has. Too many militias and too few real armies. It would displace Italy's role. Uh, in other words, we can forget any, the Italian energy company, uh, uh, remaining in charge of the most profitable oil fields in the country and gas pipelines. Mm -hmm. I think uh, eventually the Turkish oil companies and oil and gas companies will start to uh, uh, take over because they're not going to do, uh, launch a major military operation, which is going to cause some uh, political risk for Erdogan at home. After all, how many yeah. foreign missions has Turkey par to participated in other than those involving protection of the borders from Kurdish uh, issues to do uh, with Kurdish uh, fighters. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I think such an intervention by Turkey would be a major one with major goals uh, involved. Yeah. Um, and it, in, my, in many ways, I think Italy is the biggest loser uh, here, uh, other than the Libyans have been, uh, I'm, I'm talking in geopolitical terms. Yeah, now, uh, now, now you know, let's let's bring it back to sort of the, the the real basics of this. I mean, obviously, everybody's rushing into this. Mm -hmm. uh, philosophically, though, does it boil down to a conflict between the Muslim Brotherhood and their Salafist uh, brethren? Uh, the Muslim Brotherhood, mainly uh, now formed through a camp or, or or a relationship between sort of the Turks and the Qataris on one hand, and the Sal their Salafist uh, brethren, uh, including I think the so-called Madhalis, who mm -hmm. uh, bring their power exactly. from uh, from uh, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, and the generals in Egypt. Uh, does it boil down to this? It sounds very iffy in terms of explaining the conflict in these these terms. Yes, and also uh, General Haftar has nothing to do with these Salafists in in personal uh, ideals. I mean. Haftar was one of the backers of the original Libyan revolution of 1969 that uh, removed the monarchy. Uh, and he was close to Colonel Gaddafi, who was a secular, uh, although he did leverage on some Islamic tradition. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, the Green Book that he wrote does have that tradition included. But Gaddafi ruled Libya in extremely secular terms. So... Uh, Haftar's alliance with the uh, uh, UAE in Saudi Arabia and some of the militias, the Madhalis, for example, is entirely incongruent from the philosophical point. And actually, just a few days ago, uh, Haftar described his effort to take Tripoli as a jihad. So he's using strange language that doesn't befit his role and certainly does not promise anything good. Uh, as far as uh, uh, the Tripolitanian uh, attitude to life uh, mm -hmm. is concerned. This uh, Tripolitania, Tripoli was once a place where cruise ships would stop mm -hmm. uh, and, and uh, was famous for its beauty and easygoing uh, lifestyle. Uh, but what it, about the obsessions uh, of, the, the, uh, of the Gulf countries? Uh, I mean, one would argue Egyptians is... Is really the Egyptian regime is void of ideologies. It's mostly a militarist regime, just like we see in neighboring Algeria, where it's really a, there's no ideology, but mostly uh, a, a, you know a militarist. Yeah, uh, protecting the military interests it, it, and their businesses. exactly. But the Gulf monarchies uh, is you know their obsession boils down to a an ideological fight, the way you would see it happening between Saudi Arabia and Iran, for example, on the other side. Mm -hmm. Is it the same story happening here in the Libyan case, which I find very ironic and bizarre in many ways, because, look, the Muslim brotherhoods are, like you said, are largely in power in Tunisia. Uh, they, they have a political branch in Morocco. They, 
certainly have a, a minority or a small minority branch in Algeria, in Algeria. And, and they haven't really created a major, um, you know, major problems in the region, except if one sees the Turkish incursion as a risk for the Gulf monarchies and, and, and are doing everything they can to destroy the, 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 the Turkish power base, so to speak, which is sort of the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, in general, but I, I, I'm trying to understand the philosophy behind the... the... Yeah, I think um, one key to understanding the philosophical side from the discussion that you make, uh, which, which is why are the Gulf uh, monarchies involved? Well, there is one Gulf monarchy that isn't involved, and it is back in Turkey, Qatar. We still have uh, an ideological conflict between Qatar and the uh, uh, Saudi Arabia and the, the UAE, even though it's a bit milder these days, um, but Qatar is still, uh, you know, on on uh, not uh, enjoying diplomatic relations with Saudi Arabia. So um, I think uh, it's more Qatar here, perhaps that's um, uh, in a more subtle way ba uh, backing Turkey, encouraging Turkey to do this, uh, and using uh, Libya uh, as a as um, one of the battlefields to uh, fight its... I'm, I'm not sure, in fact, how to describe it because it's still unclear what Qatar and Saudi Arabia are fighting over. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, I think that, it's th that the Qatari key is important to consider here more even than, more so than the Turkish one. Uh, Turkey, certainly Erdogan does have... Um, these um, grandiose Ottoman ambitions. Yeah. And I would back them if they would bring stability back to the, to the area. But it's not clear that this would, especially if the rumors that Turkey might use militias. And we have all kinds of mixed militias of all kinds of uh, different ideology and different ethnicities, uh, simply because in, in that part of the world right now, uh, that's the way to make money, is to be a fighter. Uh, it's, it's, how else to explain the phenomenon? You have people from Sudan and Chad fighting for uh, um, both Haftar and uh, Saraj, uh, depending on who pays most. So it's, it, it's become um, an, an employment center. For, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, for and, mercenaries. And I, I, I can confirm that there's also been, um, you know, recruitment efforts by private security outfits uh, down in South Africa. I mean, oh, of course. in, uh, in uh, you know, in favor or, or in favor of uh, Khalifa the, Haftar. The, yeah, whoever mostly. pays most. And yeah. it's actually Khalifa Haftar has the money. Uh, he in, does. Because of the backing. But Qatar you know, may incur, given what's happening now, uh, may um, uh, double the efforts, even though Saraj technically controls only a small portion of uh, Tripolitania, the northern Mediterranean coast between, not even as far as, as Misrata from Sabrata, so it's a very small region, uh, even if that fight is resolved. Um, we still also have the issue of Fezzan and the Misrata militias, which are outside of both um, Haftar and Saraj. But isn't so, he in control of the southern regions, including the borders it, with Algeria, where there's tr a tremendous it, amount it, of oil? It's, uh, I'm Tenuous. talking about Fezzan, the Fezzan, the deep south, okay. uh, which is extremely porous, which is where all the migrants are coming from. Yes. Uh, the, the, the area bordering Chad and uh, Niger, I believe. Yeah, uh, I, I'm not. I don't have a map in front of me, but I think it's Niger uh, yeah. and uh, Mali. So um, that's a key strategic area, con considering what Europe needs, considering why Europe needs and wants stability in Libya. Yeah, so, and, and I can say, I mean, certainly uh, the South is very important too. Uh, to your point, uh, you, you know, there's Niger. There's also certainly Chad. Uh, that forms uh, these two countries form a sizable part of the. The border, uh, the southern border area, and, and in all those areas, there have been uh, a lot of troubles uh, specific to illegal gold mining, illegal mining in general, mm -hmm. and, and uranium mining. 
Exactly. Uh, uh, what, one thing that really, one country we haven't heard sort of involved in this discussion, uh, and I wouldn't be surprised if it's sort of remotely involved, is really Iran, which, uh, as you know, there is no sizable Shiite community in, in North Africa. It's, it's no. a minority. And, and therefore, yeah. one would think that Iran has no uh, you know, play in, 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 in the geopolitics in the region. But the relationship uh, between Turkey, Qatar, and Iran uh, tends to be somewhat uh, positive, and perhaps Iran is uh, involved somewhat indirectly? Um, I'm not sure, because Iran also has a very good relationship with Russia. And right now, Iran is so concerned about what's happening internally and on its own borders, and considering what's happened this week in Iran. And now there are suggestions that uh, the jet liner, that the Boeing 737, uh, the, uh, uh, of the Ukrainian airlines that crashed in the morning of uh, January 8th, I believe, mm -hmm. uh, four or five hours after the Iran hit uh, American bases in Iraq with missiles, uh, that it was a missile hit. So it's um, I, unclear uh, what could happen. But I'm um, sorry, what Iran may have. Uh, what interests? I, in fact, I don't really think Iran is, is involved here. When I was living in Tripoli um, in the good old days of the 90s, uh, the Islamic Republic did have an embassy in Tripoli and a few officers, but um, and they had cordial relations with um, Gaddafi's regime, even though there was some tensions over the death of Imam Musa Asadr in 1979, or rather his disappearance. Nobody mm -hmm. knows where he is. Uh, but other than than that, I think Iran is very concerned with protecting its own direct sphere yeah. right now to to have any interest in uh, obstructing anybody in um, in Libya. Yeah, yeah. So, so in terms of um, an outlook or at least scenario playing here, you see uh, sort of the situation uh, getting bogged down uh, where it is today. Uh, namely, no major progress. I mean, certainly mm. uh, Haftar and, and his foes will continue to clash uh, and it will be difficult to keep uh, taking each kilometer uh, headed towards Tripoli. And then, uh, or, or do you see the end of the stalemate eventually with Haftar winning, although mm. with Turkey there, it's going to be difficult for the, uh, you know, for Haftar to... Uh, go head to head in confrontation with the Turkish military. Yeah, I um, there was something that happened uh, today in the past 24 hours that um, made me think that perhaps Haftar will eventually have his cake, um, which is the Italian government invited Saraj and Haftar to Rome yesterday to discuss the situation, but apparently they didn't. When they invited Haftar, they didn't inform Saraj of this invitation, and Saraj was angry, so he went to the to Brussels instead of Rome, and Haftar was left uh, alone to discuss the situation with uh, the Italian Prime Minister Conte in Rome. Now, why is that important? Because Italy has backed Saraj until recently, mm. but it seems like there is pressure on Italy, perhaps from the United States. Uh, which is probably quietly, I think Trump, Haftar is much more of a Trump man. Mm, I think. He is. Yeah. So uh, there might be some pressure from the United States on Italy to, uh, to give concessions to Haftar, and Italy might be scrambling to discuss to make sure that under Haftar, any will, the Italian oil company will continue to uh, maintain its historic energy role in the country, which is the oldest of all the oil companies operating and the biggest. So you think, so, so you uh, think that there are signals that basically... There are signals that Haftar may, may eventually take over. Uh, now, um, Turkey has uh, um, issued the threat to send troops. It hasn't done so yet. But imagine, I think many Europeans are concerned because if Turkey controls Tripoli, then it can start playing the same kind of game with militias and migrants in Libya that it has in Syria. 
Mm. In other words, uh, Turkey has controlled the flow of Syrian refugees or, or refugees from the eastern side going to uh, Greece and then the Balkans and up, uh, demanding protection, essentially, from money uh, from Europe in order to uh, uh, ostensibly finance the care for these migrants and threatening when Europe uh, misbehaves, uh, threatening to release all, open the gates and flood Europe with migrants. Oh, so, it's it's weaponi- Tripoli, so it's weaponizing it, it, the refugee It's crisis. weaponizing the migration. It would weaponize the migration issue on the Mediterranean coast, uh, on the Libyan coast. So I think that's a very important uh, issue for uh, Europe and one of the cards that Siraj can play. I'm not sure why the, a compromised government between the two cannot be arranged. And I'm also not sure why uh, Libya cannot simply be split into two or three provinces as it was before Mussolini invented the idea of modern Libya uniting the two provinces in 1935, 34. So, um, because Libya, as we know it today, the united Libya, is a Mussolini concept. Yeah. It goes back to the colonial. Um, and in fact, the Tripolitanians were always much more favorable to Italian presence, the Italian presence mm-hmm. than the Cyrenaicans. That's where the resistance was. So, so we're, we're facing then a couple scenarios then. Well, the most likely scenario, in my humble opinion, would be one basically where there's a status quo. And the status quo is uh, basically 2020 be, you know, becoming uh, the equivalent of the last three, four months of 2019. Uh, the uh, Haftar's troops uh, being there, uh, trying to get into Tripoli, and uh, they're being refrained from the presence of the Turkish. Uh, the other scenario is one where basically Haftar takes over. What does a Haftar regime look like? Well, given his experience, it, it might look a little bit like Gaddafi's. Really? So you? Yeah. Uh, so this is a, uh, a Gaddafi version 2.0. Well, he's good. He's not going to be a, a sheikh. He's not going to be a, a king. He's going to be a general, a military in charge of a some, some a republic. A 75-year-old um, military man. Yeah, so, and yeah. he's got. I think his, he has a son who might uh, be interested in something. Beside all this Haftar, Saraj, the, um, one of the most interesting aspects of uh, Libya in, the, in 2019 was the suggestion that Gaddafi's son, Saif al-Islam, would run in the elections in Tripoli. Uh, and um, his popularity has risen since the days of uh, the Jamahiriya. So what role you know uh, he might play or what role if any will any elections play in haftar that's a very that's a key question will haftar be uh, another al sisi after all because let's say that libya goes democratic that would be a threat to the very people who put him in power yeah not going to uh, work uh, yeah al sisi is not going to want that kind of uh, liberal attitude in his country so he wants to make sure that whoever is in Tripoli will be close not only uh, ideologically with um, uh, Egypt but also institutionally so I think they would prefer uh, some kind of military dictatorship uh, masking as a republic. So in, in terms of the the, the threat uh, assessment for the region the primary one to be concerned is really Tunisia because the, the the border issue and the refugee issue could spill over into into Tunisia and could destabilize it. It's a small government or it's a small mm-hmm. state. It's uh, uh, economically it doesn't have really the financial capabilities to withstand uh, the sort of influx that the the Europeans have been facing for a while. Um, do you see that as a potential destabilizing destabilizing factor for for Tunisia? Tunisia is, on one hand, one of the uh, most uh, exemplary uh, countries in North Africa and actually the whole Arab world. Mm -hmm. It has a secular republic. It has one of the closest uh, things to democracy in the whole Arab world right now. Um, I think it's the only 
country that uh, uh, that, that emerged from the so-called Arab Spring mm -hmm. with something optimistic. Um, it, it's taken a while, they're building, but they are building something. Yeah. And so far, they've had a few incidents, some terrorist attacks, but who hasn't in the last period? Uh, and the country, um, the, the fact that it didn't have oil, I always saw as a blessing from an institutional and uh, cultural point of view. I think people actually had to learn something and develop uh, skills and develop institutions. So the government, the people have a stake in the government and vice versa. Mm -hmm. When you have oil, um, it's like having free money. It's, there's no incentive to, to improve yourself or to improve the country. So um, Tunisia is the, the little diamond at, at the tip. And also it's blessed from the climate point of view and, in, and uh, geological and, and agricultural. It has uh, uh, it's small desert, but not too much. Uh, beautiful coastal line, huge tourism potential, and excellent relationship with the Europeans. Yeah, and and, and culturally, it's a very diverse culture. I mean, it certainly yes. has uh, you know a, a, a collection of liberals, modernist, Islamist, traditionalist, has, right, yes. left, and that makes it an interesting place. Where... And it's secular. Exactly. Exactly. Even. Even though the Muslim Brotherhood is powerful there, uh, uh, women, for example, enjoy more rights in Tunisia than any other Arab country that I can, mm -hmm. uh, other than Syria, that is. Yes. Syria is the only other one which had the same liberal uh, constitution in no, the sense of Lebanon, protecting... Uh, Lebanon a little bit. Le Lebanon as well, okay. Uh, Lebanon, uh, uh, but Lebanon is always at risk of... Uh, given its position of uh, civil war, there's always that yeah. edge. Instead, Tunisia had, a, had the opportunity of civil war and it didn't. So in terms of your final take of where, if you were to put your, your, your money, where, where would you yeah, have things uh, let, going to go? Well, well let's say uh, Har Saraj and Haftar were two horses. I would probably bet on Haftar. At the, okay, at the moment, you think he will <laughs> be able moment, to? At the moment, yes, there's something, uh, that meeting in Rome, um, just uh, suggest to me that even the Italians have given up on, on Saraj. Now, to understand the importance of that, uh, Saraj landed in Tripoli accompanied by an Italian boat. Mm. So, so even uh, right now, the only thing Saraj can, is, can hold on to, the only string, is the fact that it is the UN recognized government. But um, uh, that could change with rea uh, with when re realistic expectations are on the ground. Yeah, and and um, uh, and on that point, uh, if a Haftar victory takes place, uh, what's typically the response of the so-called international community? They they sort of say, uh, "Well, uh, you know, the, the king is dead. Long live the king!" Now we're going to support this one. Well, I think if. If uh, Haftar can bring some kind of stability, and mm -hmm. uh, and perhaps with Saudi money and UAE money, there's something for everyone in all the militias. Uh, perhaps he can at least stabilize the country enough that some kind of evolution can take place afterwards. Yeah. But yeah. but we need you. There is no transition direct direct transition to democracy until some kind of stability is achieved. Yeah. How yeah. now? How the question is: What do Tripolitanians want? Uh, Tripoli is still the largest city, and still the capital. Um, what do they want? It's unclear. But I think everybody has had enough of this situation, which has is after all, since 2011, that perpetuates without any hope in sight. Yeah, I think I think the fear, uh, you know, from folks in Tripoli is is the potential retaliation against them if mm -hmm. uh, if uh, Haftar takes over and and I think those are some of the things that obviously the Libyans will have to deal with and mm -hmm. e eventually I, I hope that there's going to be enough pressure on you know if he takes over and, and by the way I'm still uh, I still believe that it's not going to happen I think that yeah. it's going to be uh, you know regardless of sort of the Italian position at the end of the day I think still uh, the Turks are hunkering down there and they they're gonna go after you know they're gonna support uh, the the you know the Tripoli based government uh, as long as they possibly yeah, can. But, oh, they they might, 
but there are examples throughout the region, you know, Afghanistan, Iraq, uh, that even the mightiest armies you know, with all kinds of, of equipment yep. and bases fail in the face when they're dealing with a militia. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, and that's the, that's the, the, does Turkey really want to get bogged down in another one? I don't know if Erdogan, see, he plays a lot of, he bluffs a lot and exaggerates a lot. And yeah, yes. I'm not sure to what extent he really um, is committed uh, to. He wants to go. How far does he want to go? Yeah, how much, I, I, does the, I think, how much does the Turkish public want to go? Absolutely, and I think at the end of the day, you know, to what extent his military uh, is is stretched uh, with what's happening with their involvement in uh, you know in the southern borders of Turkey and 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 all, and all these problems. So I think at the end of the day, you're absolutely right. I mean, to what extent can you can a country like Turkey with all, with all its military capabilities, at the end of the day, look, it's not, it's not a global power. It's a regional power. Maybe it feels that it has the ability to go to Libya and and uh, impose, a, you know, its its solution to the problem. On the other hand, one has to be careful. Uh, we've seen, you know, countries that are, uh, you know, more powerful than Turkey go on uh, campaigns that they have lost, uh, uh, they completely have lost. I mean, look at the French in the Sahel. It's a, you know, it's turning into a, turn out to be a disaster. Of Can course, it? but uh, that's the problem. Uh, and France teaches everybody this lesson. They lost Algeria after five years of fighting. Yeah. Mean, from, from 1957 to 62. And they had to go with the tail between their legs. Yeah. And, what, and, and then they left Vietnam before that. Yeah, uh, and on the other it, and on the other hand, you know, would um, you know, could the Turkish presence galvanize the Libyans that have not really sided with Haftar, but all of a sudden, at least the tribes anyway, all of a sudden find themselves with you know a a foreign power. Uh, it's yeah. bad. It's bad to have a, you know Haftar, uh, you know, do what he's doing, but at least he's a Libyan. There's some level of justification. Yes. Now. Uh, there is a Turkish minority in Tripolitania. There are many prominent families that have Turkish descent. Sure. But, the, the, but this, was, this goes back to, uh, the same goes in Tunisia and Algeria probably. After all, the, the Karamanli yeah. was a Turkish family. They ruled uh, Tur uh, Libya for years. Um, and their major business was piracy. Yeah. Uh, few Americans know that the first ever foreign intervention of an American army was in Libya in uh, 1812 uh, with the Marines. You know, I, I was going to start a, an editorial that would uh, introduce the idea of we're seeing the light at the end of the tunnel in the region in general. Uh, Tunisia has had its um, elections. Uh, you know, is it the best president? Is it the best parliament? Uh, one would argue probably not. But what's the alternative, right? Uh, Algeria, you know, has gone through a, the past, uh, you know, virtually 11 months in turmoil. And finally, the guy who drove that turmoil, who was responsible for that turmoil, at least from a, a personification perspective, uh, General Gaid Saleh, has died. You cannot yeah. even dream of a Hollywood scenario, like I said, like that one. <laughs> well, well the, the, they're all in their 80s. I yes, I think most of them are pushing 80s, uh, if not late 70s, but mid to late 70s. But it's it's a really a, a generational conflict that that we were witnessing. Uh, but you know, but there is there there has been a revival of what's called the Hirak movement, which is sort of the anti-regime movement uh, that 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 sort of brought uh, the voice of the people uh, of you know in 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 the forefront of what's going on in Algeria, and even though. The transition is still not as good as it should be, or it should, could have been. There is still a transition going forward. It might take several years before we see the real impact of the Hirak, even though most of the pro-Hirak activists tend to believe that uh, there, there hasn't been really a victory yet. I, I tend to disagree. I think that there is, you know, the, 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 the tracks for the trains have been laid right now. What needs to be done is basically sort of the, the non-violent work that needs to be done. And so, you know, with that, and Tunisia, well, Morocco continuing to show sign of stability, 
Um, you know, the editorial was about to focus on sort of perhaps we're seeing a little bit of ray of, or ray of light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, is the conflict, and that's sort of the conclusion for, this, uh, for our talk, is what we're seeing now part of the end or the end of the conflict, the beginning of a ray of hope that you see at the end of the tunnel, mm. or uh, wishful thinking? There is hope. Uh, after all, let's put it in, in numbers. Um, what's the population of, of Libya? At most, Libyans, I'm talking about maybe three and a half million mm -hmm. at, at most. Yes. That's the size of a city it is. Uh, in, in Europe. So if we put it in numbers, there are many more people in North Africa living in stability than not. Because yes. despite everything that's happened in Algeria, and this is actually a very positive thing, despite the, the uh, weakness, the, the, the collapse of um, politics, what we saw is not so much the collapse of institutions, but the collapse of individuals within those institutions. The institutions are still there. So whatever was done in Algeria in the past, something uh, remains. There are the there is the infrastructure from which to begin uh, a new phase of politics. The problem with Libya is that the entire infrastructure was idiosyncratic. That's the way Gaddafi built it, perhaps on purpose. That, uh, such that when he would be removed, it would collapse. Um, and uh, But Libya is the smallest population in North Africa. So uh, in, in those terms, it's, um, it's the fewest number of people living in, in this kind of turmoil. Yes, yes. That said, it also, because of its situation, it's, it's a magnet for trouble that can then spread throughout the region. So uh, how this gets solved, I don't know. Um, I think Saraj may still be hoping that if the Turks come, some kind of European force will come to fight, but there's no way. Uh, Turkey is a NATO country, and so are all the EU. You know, there's another point uh, that's probably worth mentioning uh, in comparing to the populations. I mean, the Libyans, uh, more than ever, uh, show how divided they are along tribal uh, yes. sentiments and if you look at uh, the 40 plus million Algerians th it's the opposite they if, if the past 11 months uh, ha have shown what something they've shown that basically the reason why the country is stable it's largely because there is a nationwide consensus among mm -hmm. the population and probably among <laughs> many and generationally too exactly that the country ought not to be divided along ethnic lines, the Berbers versus the Arabs and the Islamists mm -hmm. versus the Francophones. There's, there's been this sort of nationwide agreement that if, if you start falling into these kinds of differences, you're going to find yourself, without any doubt, into a civil war. And, mm -hmm. and to me, you know, you talked about earlier about the institutions that are still around and able to um, you know, keep things uh, stable, I, I would argue that the population ha you know, has played an enormous role in, uh, you know, in, in keeping things going and keeping things stable, for sure. That's what's missing in, in Libya. Um, Gaddafi ruled the country as a pan-African, so he promoted African uh, nationalism more than he did Libyan nationalism. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so there is no sense of real nation uh, b belonging to a Libyan state, uh, which is something, for example, one of the reasons why nobody would dare attack Iran is because Iran is very nationalist, even though it's an Islamic Shia country. It's Iranians have a very strong identity as Iranians. Yeah. And um, uh, North Africans, because they were further away from the Ottomans during the Ottoman Empire period, they developed their own sense of nationalism, Tunisia uh, and um, Algeria, for example, was, they, they have their own se uh, sense of statehood, as does Egypt. So they've always been uh, more stable compared to the uh, Middle East uh, itself. Well, yeah. uh, so on that, I think we're um, assuming nothing changes. Let's, let's regroup uh, in about three months from now, assuming if things change in the meanwhile. I think it would probably be worth to do uh, another uh, round of discussion uh, if, obviously, there is a break in the status quo going forward. And with that, thank you very much, Alessandro, and I look thank you. forward to talking to you soon.